Okay. Thanks, Rick. And um, Carl, I just need to add, and, and um, Jeff pulled me aside before I came up here and said that for this time while I'm up here that it's his prerogative to delegate the blame. So um, for the time I'm up here, I'll, I'll be the one to blame for, for where we stand, for everything. <laughs> but anyway, appreciate the invitation to be here today. I must say this topic is, is actually near and dear to my, my heart because um, I think back to my, over my career, uh, you know, 31 years ago when I first started, over 31, uh, one of my first projects was related to dealing with legacy pipeline systems, in particular cast iron. And, and one of my first projects in the Atlanta area was to uh, replace cast iron pipe using a live insertion technology, which was relatively new at the time. It was actually a very effective method to uh, replace pipes, uh, especially cast iron pipe, uh, while it was also still serving the customer. But anyway, today I wanted to have a conversation with you about what we're doing related to methane emissions. Um, uh, really start with helping you understand our authority, our limitations, and then really uh, what we are doing um, in, in this area. First off, related to our, our jurisdiction, many of you know we were formed out of the um, 1968 Natural Gas Pipeline Safety Act of 1968, and that act um, came out of a, the aftermath of, of a failure in Texas and, and really in the aftermath of a number of failures where uh, there was a need to uh, roll up the pipeline safety program uh, at the national level uh, from what was at the time a, a patchwork of state oversight. And so we were formed and we, we issued our first regulation in 1970 related to, to uh, natural gas pipelines, the 49 CFR Part 192 that many of you are familiar with, it's the pipeline safety regulations. Uh, the focus on our enabling authority uh, coming out of that and as it continues today, it, as, as Dan also uh, mentioned, is really safety. Our focus is uh, protecting people from incidents from pipelines and harm to the public. Um, and we don't currently have authority to issue uh, regulations that address climate change directly, although I would say that really our regulations do impact methane emissions and climate change because they do act to prevent um, releases. So therefore it does really all of our initiatives support the goal of reducing methane em emissions. Obviously we don't have economic missions or no, we don't permit or site pipelines. Uh, that's as far as siting goes, that's the role of FERC for an interstate pipeline or for a liquid pipeline, it would be the role of the individual states. Uh, there is one area that we are addressing um, that came out of an executive order, you know, and, and, and this is among the initiatives that Dan had highlighted um, related to greenhouse gas and the Obama administration's um, focus on addressing greenhouse gas emissions. An executive order. Uh, requires us and other federal agencies to consider the impact of, of what we call social cost of carbon um, on our rulemaking. And so we're doing that. Uh, what you'll see is as we go forward with the gas rule in particular, we've considered that. We've equated uh, the savings in methane emission that were a result of that rule to a cost, to an amount. We quantify it and then also associate it with a, an actual cost. And um, that has really introduced a, a new debate, if you will, that, um, you know, there's a certain cost associated with repair of pipelines that really is, it's not a discussion we've had before as far as, okay, if we're going to blow a line down to replace a section of pipe, there is an emission of methane that happens when that occurs. I'm sure we'll be having more conversations about that, um, you know, and how that is offset by the savings in emissions as far as preventing future accidents, because that's our goal when we issue a regulation is to improve safety um, and not, uh, not, not go backwards in the safety arena, so to speak. But the, the ultimate impact is to also um, reduce, you know, the side benefit is to reduce methane emissions. As far as what we've been doing, um, you know, there are a number of um, Initiatives we've been involved with, uh, I know Dan and Mark highlighted some of them. We're, we're also participating in them, but certainly um, with the 
quadrennial energy review. We've participated in some of those conversations. I know I've had a number on, you know, possible outcomes of that that, that could impact methane emissions while also uh, ensuring pipeline safety. Uh, we have been in close coordination with the EPA. Uh, and in fact, they participated recently in our uh, R&D forum in Chicago this past year. And certainly with the Environmental Defense Fund, Mark Brownstein, uh, we welcomed him as, as a new member of our um, gas, our gas uh, pipeline safety advisory committee this past October. Um, as well as we, we did have EDF participation at our R&D forum, uh, in particular in our, our technical work group related to methane emissions and leaks. Uh, and then also we're, you know, we're reviewing our regulations, or our regulations do address as far as possible leak pass and then actions that uh, we could take to improve safety that's, you know, relevant to pipeline safety, as I mentioned. You know, other actions we're taking or have taken, certainly, uh, I mean, I've covered the first one there. You know, our focus is keeping the product in the tank, keeping it in the pipe. Uh, but, you know, in 2004, we had the Transmission Integrity Management Program that was implemented that overlaid our existing regulations and required operators to know and understand risk and take action to address risk to prevent pipeline failures. And that uh, has been since 2004. And more recently, Distribution Integrity Management, and this is the umbrella that will cover the legacy pipe in the city, such as cast iron, bare steel pipe had requirements to address uh, similarly risk, but also um, improvements in uh, management and repair of leaks was the focus there. Other policies that we've implemented and are working on, excess flow valves, that's a device that's in the line that if there's a, a break in the service line, it will shut the flow of gas. Uh, again, the focus there was, was relevant to safety, however, the side benefit as well, as with most of our regs, is uh, reduced methane emissions. We also have another reg in place relevant to excess flow valves to extend that to multifamily houses and buildings, and that's uh, in the works right now. A big program, the second bullet, and I think, uh, Christina, you had mentioned this, excavation damage prevention, and, and um, Chairman Roberti uh, from Rhode Island, Rhode Island had mentioned it earlier. Uh, damage prevention, you know, that's, that's the leading cause of harm to people. And, and, of course, you know, we're in the business of protecting people. And we have a huge focus on that. And we have a rulemaking on that relevant to enforcing damage prevention laws in the states. And we look forward to seeing that move forward. But that's, that's a key area of interest for us. And then lastly, in R&D, there's a number of initiatives I'll uh, point out uh, in research and development that are, we're funding to um, address um, emissions and... Um, you know, leak repair of pipelines. Uh, and I'll point one out. Um, well, first off, before I get to that, um, as far as the leak past relevant to, to pipelines, to gas pipelines, uh, your sources of leaks obviously related to piping or uh, piping flanges, gaskets, or connections, you know, meters or line valves. You know, like line valves, we also are looking at uh, our regulations for where valves are placed. Um, when you, enter, when you put a new valve into the system, you do introduce potentially another source of, of leak down the road. So that's part of our consideration as we move forward there. Again, that, you know, it creates, it creates a hazard, but then also it's there to prevent um, a casualty as well as far as you have a ready access to control of the pipeline. Certainly that was an issue that came out of the San Bruno failure that we're, we're addressing. Rotating equipment or compressors. I know uh, EDF, I know big folks, so that one of their studies is, is relevant to, um, you know, quantifying emissions or showing where the, the emissions take place, and uh, certainly compressor stations are, are one of them. And then just normal pipeline operations, just blowing down or purging of pipelines, um, you know, relief valves. Uh, when we run inline inspection devices or PIGs, there's a release that occurs when you install a PIG, you pressure the pipe up, pull the pig out, there's, there's always uh, a release related to uh, just the operation there. And then pneumatic controllers, I know a lot of work's been done to uh, address this, the controllers that do have a bleed of natural gas that, that's part of their control scheme for controlling gas flow. And we need to understand too, lastly, about leak rates. Um, I know Mark talked about this re regarding um, 
you know, quantifying leaks. They, the leaks in the system can vary due to temperature, uh, which has a physical impact on the density of the molecules that are being released. The temperature, the pressure, certainly, if, if it's packed together, you have more, uh, it's a more increased volume. Um, and then the size, obviously, the physical size of the opening. Is it a bell joint, you know, kind of an annular area uh, or a small area, or is it a full open? So that, that has a huge impact on the size of the leak. And then gas quality, certainly the amount of methane in the gas. You know, natural gas is a blend of, of hydrocarbons, primarily methane, but that varies. But that goes into the equation on methane emissions. We have a project that we're currently teeing up that is an outgrowth of our recent R&D forum um, related to methane and uh, has to do with measuring volumes and quantifying the releases of methane. We're pretty good at uh, measuring or knowing where detecting methane releases, but this will focus on quantifying that um, amount. And it, it also it will take a look at um, or consider the leak grading system that's currently in place that's currently at three grades, tends to be grade one leak for a hazardous leak, grade two for one that represents a probable future hazard, or grade three that's uh, a leak that needs to be monitored. That's a standard that's been developed by the Gas Piping Technical Committee that's in use today. Um, and then lastly, they'll develop a framework to, um, to integrate that into other uh, policies that we have. We expect that award to be made, or it could include multiple awards early next year. Let me talk a little bit about cast iron. Um, you know, in the aftermath of our, um, of the Secretary's call to action and, and the increase focused on pipeline safety and taking action to address pipeline safety in the aftermath, of, I guess at the time, most recently, the Allentown, Pennsylvania failure, we did post on our website, or we always had the information, but we made it more readily available uh, related to gas iron inventory. And this is just a, a snapshot of, of some of the data that's readily available on the website as far as tracking by year the inventory of cast iron. You can see it coming down. I uh, would like to see it come down more, obviously. And then also the bare steel pipe, which is also uh, considered a, a higher risk type asset. Uh, just a Schematic there on the, on the right at the top is one of the methods of uh, renewing cast iron or extending the service life, if you will, of cast iron pipe. It involves installing a liner, which doesn't really take it out of the system, but it does address uh, leaks on the system. It does uh, buy you some time or buy an operator a time uh, just before it's ultimately replaced. And then other, other areas we're looking at relevant to... Uh, Research is. Um, hold on, let me back up. Make sure I come. Just with existing pipe, just this structural valuation of corroded pipe or pipe that's been graphitized, just to be able to quantify the effects of that and be able to locate that. That's one of the challenges of 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 operating a cast iron system is to know where you have issues. Cast iron can be in pristine condition over 100 years old in certain soils, but in other soils it will be highly graphitized, and being able to predict that is, is a key area. And then another aspect of our R&D is related to cured in place liners. That schematic I just showed you um, deals with that and understanding the effectiveness of that. Lastly, I wanted to talk a bit about hydrostatic testing. Um, you know, in the aftermath of the San Bruno uh, incident um, and the preceding recommendations from the NTSB and uh, mandates from the Congress, we have gone to rulemaking to deal with the so-called grandfather clause, which um, are essentially pipelines that are, were in place when we enacted regulations that had not been pressure tested. We're, we're addressing that um, in the regulation. But we're also, as, as was contained in our statute, um, in our reauthorization, we're looking at not only requiring a, a regime to, to test a line that's been previously untested, but also alternatives to that. And there's a lot of uh, work being done to, to be able to improve ILI tools to um, 
and along with other methods to perhaps replace or be an alternative in hydrostatic testing. Uh, and certainly, you know, when we hydro align, if we see a, a break, it's a destructive test. So you see a picture there of one that's, uh, you know, a line that had undergone a test and you had a break there. And I, we really, as a regulator, I kind of see that it's kind of a mixed blessing, but I see that as, as a good thing because it's designed to do just what that picture shows you right there. You want to break the pipe because you don't, you're putting it under a pressure that it will never see in its service life, but you want to find these things so that in its service life you'll never see that pop up and, and create an issue down the road. But ultimately the conversation here will be, um, you know, how much testing is done and how much impact that has on emissions. Uh, we have addressed that in our rulemaking, though. And just some final thoughts on the conversation we're having on methane emissions. I know there are a lot of uh, initiatives in place. I think they'll ultimately eventually coalesce into a, uh, an action plan or a con concise action plan. But, you know, do we have a uniform picture right now? Perhaps we don't right now, but there's a lot of um, to be determined uh, based on all the initiatives that are in place. Technology solutions, detection's good. As I mentioned, quantifying is not as good. Cost recovery, I think, has been mentioned. And the ever, the ongoing balance between who pays for it, the rate payer or the shareholder, and who would regulate the industry as we go toward methane emissions. Certainly, EPA has a lead role in reporting of methane emissions and certainly related to the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. We need to consider resources. Certainly on the government side, if we're going to, in, on the state side, if we're going to be uh, having a larger role in regulation, we need to address uh, both funding and the human capital needed. And we need to make sure while we're addressing methane emissions and certainly the balance between addressing a, a, a leak that, that needs to be repaired with, um, with pipeline safety. And, and that's just to, to acknowledge that um, you know, relevant to pipeline safety, you may have a smaller leak in an area that creates a bigger hazard because it's close to a building wall. It's more of a public hazard than, say, a leak in a field that might be larger, but it's not an immediate public hazard. But it's a greater hazard on the greenhouse gas uh, side of things. So we need to balance that as we go forward. And with that, I look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you.